The Tom Woods Show, episode 1928. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. Start your day like a true Tom Woods Show listener with the official coffee of the Tom Woods Show, Press House Coffee. They've got a wide variety of mouth-watering roasts, and it's the best coffee I've ever tasted. Take 20% off your first order at PressHouseCoffee.com slash Woods and use promo code Woods at checkout. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. Well, as things continue to open up across the United States and restrictions are dropped, It did start to look as if maybe we don't need to talk about this much anymore. But I'm not so sure about that. For one thing, it is extremely important for us to set the record straight. We cannot allow the conventional wisdom to become Dr. Fauci saved millions of lives because some people listen to him, but the stupid rubes who didn't listen to him are responsible for all the deaths and this and that. And that the mitigation measures they instituted did a lot of good, we can see that this is not true. For example, my COVID charts quiz helps to prove the point. You should check that out if you haven't already. COVID charts with an S, quiz.com, COVID charts, quiz.com. It has you look at a series of charts and identify which, which one, which line on the chart is a state that opened or which is one that's been wearing masks heavily or whatever, and you cannot tell the difference. And you may say, oh, but there are a variety of differences between these places that we have to account for. I guarantee you in March 2020, nobody thought you would be reduced to that level of subtlety when looking at graphs of different places. It would be one graph has just got everybody dead and the other one is flat. Nobody thought you would have to introduce that level of subtlety. The fact that we have to introduce that level of subtlety, and I don't even think convincingly, goes a long way toward answering the question of whether this stuff really helped us or not. And we can't let, we've let a lot of falsehoods become the conventional wisdom in the past, going back nearly a hundred years now to the Great Depression. Conventional wisdom there is that capitalism run amok caused that. Now, if you want the definitive answer to that, you can read Murray Rothbard's book, America's Great Depression. Now, bear in mind, there are some economics in there. And this is not, I remember reading on Amazon a review that just made me, reminded me of the admonition not to cast your pearls before swine, because here we have this brilliant analysis by Rothbard. And somebody bought it thinking it would be like a social history of the Great Depression, like about how people ate ketchup sandwiches and people banded together to help that. Okay, you can read books about that if you want to, but that's not what this is about. This is the why did the Great Depression occur? The fact that you're eating ketchup sandwiches, well, it's a little bit late now. We want to get to maybe figuring out how to prevent people from having to eat ketchup sandwiches. And in order to do that, we have to understand economic theory and where the depression came from. And no, it was not caused by quote unquote capitalism. But that is the conventional wisdom. And even the free market answer in some circles is, yeah, it's not capitalism's fault. It's the Federal Reserve's fault for not intervening enough. But see, that too is basically a, an indictment of capitalism because you're saying that we need some institution outside the market to do non-market things in order to protect the economy. Well, okay, if that's your view, that's your view. But that's not a free market view. So the, the real free market view comes from the Austrian School of Economics and Murray Rothbard in particular in that important book from 1963. Still a great book. Nothing has changed, of course, since then. So still a great book. Much more recently, we have the financial crisis and the housing boom and bust culminating in 2008. And I'll tell you, I did my very best to try to stop them from saying to us, oh, we know what caused that. That was capitalism, and uh, that just goes to show what happens when we give you stupid rubes too much freedom, and now your overlords need to be in charge more. Well, okay, okay, there's no way I was going to get them to stop saying that, of course. I tried to stop that from becoming the conventional wisdom by at least providing an alternative, at least providing a different point of view, and of course, that was in my book, Meltdown. And incidentally, Meltdown, you can get the audiobook version at tomwoodsaudio.com. 
And so if you've never joined Audible before, they give you a free audiobook when you join. And if you decide to cancel, you don't pay anything and they let you keep the free audiobook. And I still get my royalty, so it doesn't matter to me how you get it. So TomWoodsAudio.com is how to get that. I bet most people don't remember this story or maybe weren't listening to me at the time or, or reading me at the time. But the man who read the audiobook for Meltdown wrote to me. He said, look, I'm an Obama voter. And when I got the assignment to read your book and I saw that it was from Regnery Publishing, I've had my books published by a lot of publishers, Columbia University Press, Basic Books, Random House. But I've also had them published by Regnery, which is a conservative publishing house that's been around since 1947. Anyway, the guy said, when I saw this book and I saw that it was from Regnery, I thought, oh, here we go, another another right-wing screed. Because I think he had recently read one of G. Gordon Liddy's books. And G. Gordon Liddy had his merits, but I remember flipping through one of his books at a library once, and it was just fluff. There was just no substance in there at all. It was just a bunch of his outraged opinions, but with no substance. And I guess that's what he expected Meltdown to be. And he said, this book has really, really made me think because you make a very convincing case. And I thought, now, isn't that nice? He didn't have to write to me like this. That's not part of the job description. So that made me very happy. So Meltdown did have a reasonable impact. It was a New York Times bestseller for 10 weeks. And I got to do a lot of media, mostly right of center, but not exclusively. And you may say, oh, that's preaching to the choir. No, it's not, not on the Federal Reserve. You think anybody in the conservative movement was talking about the Federal Reserve System? They were all floundering in 2008, trying to figure out what the explanation was. They weren't going to say the Federal Reserve, mostly because none of them knew anything about it. And secondly, because nobody else ever talks about it. And oh my goodness, we are the official conservative movement. We can't have the left calling us cranks because we deeply care what these people think about us. Ugh, you're never going to get the right analysis from that kind of attitude. So they were reduced to saying, well, the Community Reinvestment Act of 1977, you know, from 30 years earlier caused it. Okay, well, I don't think that's particularly convincing. So I wrote this book precisely for that reason, so that even if a tsunami of misinformation overwhelmed the country, there would still at least be a record. There'd still at least be a dissident voice with a convincing argument. Well, back on episode 1885, I interviewed a filmmaker who, along with a team of other filmmakers, is making the ultimate documentary on all this. And this is extremely important, even if everything opens back up, even if we never hear about COVID-19 ever again, this has to get done so that at least there is a dissident voice out there for when they try to pull some crazy thing again. And they say, well, we saved you from COVID, so we're going to save you from this thing. We need to have it. Not because it'll convince the crazy people, but because it'll convince regular people and maybe some influential people. We do have a little influence here and there. And he explained to us what the vision behind it was. Well, they're going to do it with the charts. And you know the charts do not tell the story Fauci once told. And they're going to use the damning quotations like Fauci not really understanding. He's not really sure why Texas hasn't done badly since getting rid of its masks. Or... Uh, the restrictions being lifted and everything being fine in various places. They're not really sure. Slavitt, Osterholm, Fauci. And of course, they're doing this anonymously because they don't want their careers ruined. And I can tell you that these people all have distinguished careers. One of them was interviewed by Thad Russell on his unregistered podcast. And Thad actually went ahead and asked him what I had not asked them which is uh, what kind of films have you worked on in the past and stuff. And they've got, they've got credentials like you wouldn't believe. So this is going to be fantastic. I realize you might feel hesitant about supporting a project where you don't know who the people behind it are. But I am putting my own name and reputation on the line here to tell you these are good, skilled people. And this will be an important project. And a Joanne Skousen, who's been running the Anthem Film Festival for Freedom Fest year after year after year, she also can vouch for them. So the link to support what they did, what they're doing, is tomwoods.com slash doc, D-O-C, for documentary. tomwoods.com slash doc. 
Now, as I told you, I actually put 10 grand of my own money into this thing because after over a year of covering this, I am convinced that this is the issue of our time and I want to do what I can. So those of you out there who have the means to help, any amount is welcome. And I urge you to, to help and be a part of this. But especially those of significant means for whom a check for 10 grand is like nothing, please, please consider this because this is urgently necessary. So check out tomwoods.com slash doc. And that now we're getting all this stuff about the Delta variant. And yet we look at the numbers and it does not appear any more deadly than whatever the original was. You look at countries where it started to take over and the numbers are fine. So the hysteria, here's a surprise, the hysteria bears no resemblance to the actual facts. Well, there's something new in this whole thing, right? So I'm not particularly concerned about the Delta variant, but I'm reading over and over about uh, the devastation it's going to do. Now, look, maybe it will do terrible devastation and I'll look foolish for saying this. Okay, I doubt it. And another thing, even if things did return to normal in the U.S., there is the rest of the world to think about. Those are also people. And what's being done to people around the world is unconscionable. And I get that an awful lot of the people in those countries think this is a good idea. I get that. Those people are hopeless. There's no reasoning with them. But there is a substantial minority of decent people in these countries. And I don't think we should abandon them. We've got to keep talking. We've got to keep sending out videos, dispatches from the United States, showing people normal life resuming, large sporting events with huge crowds, concert tours with huge crowds, people walking around without masks, and the case numbers continuing to fall. Well, I just read an article that I'm going to link to at tomwoods.com slash 1928. It's in the American Conservative, and it's by a fellow named James Jeffrey, who's a freelance journalist. And he says, and the headline is, keep opening up America, the world is watching. And he's talking in particular from the perspective of the UK. And he puts it this way, increasing number of Brits, including myself, can't help but notice on social media the images of sporting events and concerts in the U.S. utterly rammed with jubilant crowds, and we are duly responding, hold on, why aren't we doing it like that? And he cites a book by a Laura Dodsworth called A State of Fear, How the U.K. Government Weaponized Fear During the COVID-19 Pandemic. She says the pandemic has left us one of the most frightened countries in the world from the government's behavioral scientists to roadside signs telling us to stay alert, the incessantly doom-laden media commentary to masks literally keeping the fear in our faces, we've become afraid of each other. Now, you could say that about the United States also, but it's definitely worse over there. And I find that if you talk to people about the likelihood that they're going to wind up hospitalized, they're wrong by a factor of a thousand. I don't it's unbelievable. Some, uh, a doctor I know who's a supporting listener came up to me at Porkfest last week and told me a story of a, of a young man he spoke to who was concerned about COVID. And he said to the kid, what do you think the chances are you'd be hospitalized if you got it? And the kid said 50%. And it's actually like, I don't know, I don't know if it's five out of a thousand. It might even be less than that. It's vanishingly small. It was probably even less than that chances that, that a young, healthy kid would actually be hospitalized with COVID. He said 50%. So he has no idea what's going on. I don't know what the latest numbers are off the top of my head. I apologize. But this doctor was telling me, and I was being pulled in a million directions, but it's invisible almost. That you would actually be a fatality is unthinkable, really. With no comorbidities, it's basically unthinkable. And somehow he's endured, this kid, has endured a year and a half of this, and has somehow managed to keep any sensible voice away from his ears. That's a feat in itself. He's managed to keep any dissenting voice from his ears, and he's not even listening to the official voices because none of them are saying 50%. That's just pure panic. Stoked, indeed, by these mainstream sources, even if they themselves haven't quite said this. It's like uh, George W. Bush never said Iraq caused 9-11 but he allowed the insinuation to float there 
and they didn't really rush to correct people who were under that false impression. Well, this is kind of the situation we're facing now. Jeffrey points out further, current research indicates how just the words you say to yourself have the power to shape your attention, which in turn controls your emotions that influence your confidence and thereby performance. And he cites Ian Robertson, who is a professor of psychology at Trinity College in Dublin, who's the author of a book called How Confidence Works. Robertson says, self-belief is a superpower that can be harnessed. Confidence and anxiety are competing rivals for your actions and attention. Anxiety inclines you to retreat in avoidance of failure, while confidence is a bridge to the future that impels you forward in anticipation of reward. Then Jeffrey himself adds that the media coverage in the UK has been, in his words, disastrously one-sided. That, of course, they're getting only one perspective on events that are unfolding, but they're also not really being told about the good news coming out of the United States, that Normal life is returning in place after place. The masks coming off faster than we than I expected them to. And we're not all dead. We're just going ahead living our lives. But yet, if you're in the UK, you could be forgiven for not actually knowing that. And he says, so thank goodness for those sporting events, concerts, and everything else happening. The opening up in the US can spark sorely needed confidence in the UK. Suddenly, Lady Liberty's lamp really seems to be giving off more of a shine these days after long seeming dimmed. Jeffrey is saying that what the UK in particular has been put through, the psychological damage alone, has seriously altered its national character, and he wonders if it can ever be brought back. And then he cites a Telegraph article, unless the government gets a grip, what ought to be a time of renaissance will instead be remembered as just another period of crippling, debilitating national decline. Then he says, and you thought you had problems, Uncle Sam. It's hard to know just how much of a crisis the UK could be facing, given, as the Telegraph puts it, the pernicious cultural revolution bequeathed by the pandemic and its lockdowns. It's a great piece that I urge you to read. As I say, I'll link to it at tomwoods.com slash 1928. He seems to give a little bit too much credit to the lockdowns. He cites somebody as saying, now he's not necessarily endorsing this, but it's left open-ended and unclear, that sure, the lockdown saved tens of thousands of lives. Well, it's not clear that that's the case. And it's not clear, are these net tens of thousands of lives? So that's factoring in all the cancer patients who are going to die sooner because they didn't catch it in time. At one time, at least, the UK was estimating 60,000 of those. Did the lockdown save 60,000 lives? Not to mention other causes of death and deteriorating health from the lockdowns. So I don't know if that person was thinking about that or not. But also, again, my COVID charts quiz, I don't understand. If At least Michael Osterholm, who was the Biden advisor for a while, who is an expert on influenza, spent 40 years of his life studying influenza. And Osterholm at least had the honesty early on to say that this mask thing is not a panacea at all. He says, you look at people wearing their masks and they think they're protecting themselves. He said, this is not how it works. He said, for one thing, look at the masks they have on. This is like saying, I'm going to keep the water out of my submarine by closing three out of the five windows. It doesn't work that way. All right, let's take a quick pause for something happy. Because today's show is brought to you by the official coffee of the Tom Woods Show, Press House Coffee. If you haven't tried it yet, shame on you. It is delicious. This is the coffee that converted me late in life. Oh, that sounds pretty morbid, late in life. Let's say later in life, into a coffee drinker. The simple mission of Press House is to make it possible to enjoy the best cup of coffee you've ever had. Their ever-evolving selection of coffees means there's something for everyone. You got the rich, chocolatey, nutty, dark roasts fruity and vibrant light roasts. But with this wide, ever-changing offering of coffees from around the world, the hard part is deciding which one of these mouth-watering roasts do I want to try. Well, they've solved that problem. They now have a dead simple coffee quiz. Takes you a few seconds to complete. Four questions any coffee drinker can answer, and your answers will tell head roaster Polly how acidic, sweet, earthy, or savory your favorite coffees will be. And that allows him to hand-select four coffees just for you. 
So go to PressHouseCoffee.com slash Woods to take the quiz and be sure to use promo code Woods at checkout for 20% off your first order. That's PressHouseCoffee.com slash Woods and promo code Woods. Well, Osterholm, and now, doggone it, I cannot find where he said it. It's not on his own Twitter timeline, but he did say somewhere, maybe in response to somebody on Twitter, I cannot find it, but I'm not going out of my mind. I know this is true. He said uh, a couple of months ago that there is no good explanation for why Iowa, totally open, at least in terms of state regulations, should be doing so much better than heavily locked down Michigan. There's no explanation for that. Now, when you go on Twitter, oh, everybody's got an explanation. Well, Iowa has this and that quality, and that's the difference between... He's not trying to explain it away. He's honest enough to say, you know, according to my playbook, this shouldn't be happening. And he said, anybody who claims he does have a simple explanation for this is lying to you. And as I say, and as I've been saying, this is all I want them to say from the start. We don't fully understand what's happening here. We do not fully understand. It might be years before we fully understand what just went on. But he actually had the honesty to say, I don't get this. This should not be happening. And that's basically what Slavitt has said, that the success of Florida is just a little bit beyond our ability to understand. Well, how about you try before you keep ruining people's lives as your default position? And again, as we've seen with Fauci in Texas, he doesn't have an explanation. So I would be very, very reluctant to say this or that measure saved a whole bunch of lives or did any good because we, we have control groups now. We have places that didn't do these things. And they seem to be doing about as well. And they didn't terrorize their society to the point where huge swaths of the population will never be the same again. And not to mention destroyed livelihoods, destroyed dreams, elderly people kept in debilitating isolation. And in many societies, what, in the United States, 45% of people dying from this are in nursing homes. Nursing homes have a typical lifespan of about 18 months. When you go into a nursing home, you've got an average of about 18 months left in your life. And for some of these people, of course, that means that some of them would die much sooner than that on average. And they were prevented from seeing their families because it was thought this was the humane way to go. But if you were to ask some of these people, you can have 18 months in isolation or eight months, but you get to see your family all the time. Who's going to choose the isolation? When you're 89 years old, who's going to say, I'd rather just be in solitary confinement for a while and then die that way? I just don't see it. Why not let them choose? Oh, and then on Twitter recently, I just saw a tweet from somebody who goes by lefty lockdown skeptic, quoting Mayor de Blasio of New York City regarding the Delta variant. He says, if anything occurs, we will make adjustments quickly. And she says, they'll lock down again. They'll impose mask mandates again. Once you make all of life about prevention of one illness, it never ends, as we are seeing before our eyes. So for those of you saying, well, we can talk about other things now. I don't think so just yet. I mean, well, obviously I am talking about other things, but I mean, we can't just leave this topic entirely. That's my point. It's still shaping the world and it could still be shaping our medium-term future. All right, now as we depart today, number one reminder, come to the 2000th episode. It's looking like it's going to be a pretty big group of people. <laughs> We're going to have a lot of fun. So, And I've got several surprise guests. And it's not Ron Paul, so come on. I mean, don't, it's not going to be like that. And plus, uh, Dr. Paul does not fly commercial anymore, and I can't outfit a private plane for him just for the, if I, sorry. So it's not going to be him. But several people you'll be happier there are not on the bill. But of those on the bill, just those alone, you're going to enjoy tremendously. It was going to be an evening of tremendous entertainment. Register at TomWoods2000.com. And the other thing is, I have a listener who is in project management and he's started a blog where he shares the lessons he's learned or the key issues he's confronted in his time as a project manager, and it's presented in a problem-solution format. So the format is problem, solution, summary. So you can use these as examples as you're studying in continuing professional development or as examples for your project teams. So check out myprojectlessons.com, and you're looking at the work of a Tom Wood Show listener. I'll link to myprojectlessons.com, 
at tomwoods.com slash 1928. And if you would like to get a shout out for a blog you're just starting, make sure you get your hosting through my link and you will get uh, publicity from me and various other supports that will give you a big advantage as you launch. So get the details about that and how to do that at tomwoods.com slash publicity. I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.